Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. On the phone with me today, I have Dr. Carlin Bersenko in New Hampshire. Carlin is the principal at Zen Workplace. She's an organizational psychologist and performance coach, and she helps individuals find greater happiness and fulfillment in their professional lives. And she works with organizations to help create amazing environments for their teams that drive productivity. Carlin will also be speaking this year at South by Southwest at a session called Zen Your Work, Creating an Ideal Work Experience. Carlin, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. And as just before we got started, we were talking a little bit about South by Southwest. And I understand, uh, based on what you were sharing, that you got a chance to speak last year as well. It sounds like on a really similar topic. So how exciting to be going back again. Oh, I'm so excited to go back again. You know, South by Southwest is a great audience of very eager professionals that are looking to learn and expand their work experience in so many different ways. And I just love that they have a workplace track because no matter what your profession is and what you're going to South by Southwest for specifically, everyone has to deal with workplace issues. So it makes total sense. Totally. And this year, you're going to be talking about the ideal work experience. And so I'm curious, from your perspective, what elements come into play that impact sort of our ideal work experience? You know, the thing about the ideal work experience is that it's all individual. It's based on what experience you want to create at work. And so it's really hard for me to say what's ideal for you or the next person or the next person um, because it really depends on what you want. So what I try to do in the session is to help people create a vision of what they want and understand how their actions every day in every interaction with every coworker in every meeting contribute or detract from supporting that vision. Oh, that's great. Well, so can you give us maybe like a couple of examples of things that might be important to certain people? I get that it's maybe um, specific to each person, but maybe what are like one or two things that for some people helps to create a more ideal work experience? Um, Sure. So I think that the number one thing that people need to consider in creating an ideal work experience actually has nothing to do with work. It has to do with your work-life balance. Hmm. And because we actually know that work-life balance is the number one indicator of job satisfaction. So if your balance is out of whack in any way, you're not going to be as happy at work as you could be, as productive, um, as creative, or any of those things. Now, balance is individual. It's not about you only work 40 hours and you go home and you veg on the couch and watch Netflix. You have to figure out what the right balance is for you, and it's going to change throughout the course of your life. But getting that under control as a means to get your stress level under control is absolutely critical. Oh, that's interesting. So in your workshop, is it is the idea that you're going to be working with people to sort of identify what those things are that are important to them that maybe they should be focusing on? Yeah, I mean, there's really three parts to the workshop. The first is really understanding how to own your perspective when it comes to the workplace. Because that's, that's a key part of this. A lot of times people, when they're going into work, they allow little things to get to them mm-hmm. that, frankly, are not important at all in the big picture. And it's about being very mindful of what perspective you're bringing into the office with you, knowing that you have valuable contributions to make no matter what your coworkers say or think or how they might detract from it and really owning it and having that self-confidence. So that's part of it. And then the other part is exactly that, just creating your vision of what you want to experience at work and learning how to be mindful of how do my actions contribute to that vision. So I'll give you another example because I think that workplace relationships are something that, you know, the average person is going to say, I want to have good relationships with my coworkers. That just makes sense, right? But then they go into work and they might complain about their coworkers behind their back or throw them under the bus in meetings and mm. or, you know, try to take credit for their ideas. None of those actions contribute to building good relationships with your coworkers. That's right? true. Mm-hmm. 
So it's about being just very mindful of what you say you want and how your actions reflect that. So I'm curious, as you talk to people, do you notice that there are certain age groups that this issue is more or less important to in terms of ideal work experience? Like, are we focused on it more when we're younger? Or is there a point sort of mid-career? Or do you feel like people are sort of equally focused on it throughout their careers? Well, I think that in theory, people always want to create a good work experience for themselves, but it becomes particularly important, I find, around um, 30 to uh, 50-ish, maybe more like 45-ish, that kind of mid-career person, because Mm -hmm. when you're younger in your career, you're really just learning at Mm -hmm. that point, up until you're in your late 20s to early 30s. You're more of like an apprentice at that point, and you're figuring it out, and you're figuring out What does it mean to even be a professional and exist in this world? So that's, in my ideal world, we would start with people that are younger, but it really becomes more top of mind to people as they get further on in their career. They're thinking, I have to do this for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. I better make what I want out of this and so I don't have to go into work and be miserable every day. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, so speaking of sort of designing a work experience, I read a story that you wrote about working in a toxic workplace and um, working for a narcissist in particular. And it really struck a chord with me because I've talked lately with a couple of different professionals who are finding themselves in what sounds like a similar situation where it's very toxic. Um, Normally, I probably wouldn't ask you to share a personal story, but I think this is a story that you share openly. And so I'm curious if you might be willing to share with us a little bit about your own experience working for a narcissist and how you kind of made it through that experience. Yeah, so it is an experience that I talk about very openly. How I actually got into this work was in studying workplace bullying Mm. and, and narcissistic behavior and that sort of thing. And, you know, I've actually worked for a couple narcissists throughout my career. I, be- I believe the story that most people know because it was in Harvard Business Review um, is was my most recent experience, which I went to work for this woman and um, I was so excited to go and work for her. I was so excited about this job. She just came across just very charismatic and had it together and I thought that this is a person I can learn from and about three months into the job it just started to go very very downhill Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it was because I had I had started to see things I started to see under the hood I guess and started to see not everything was exactly like I thought it was I stopped admiring her I Mm -hmm. stopped feeding into and just being very complimentary all the time I started questioning her and well why are we doing things this way why why can't we try doing them this way sort of thing and that does not go over well with a narcissist Mm -hmm. and um so it just it kept getting worse and and you know, part of you when you're working for someone who's a workplace bully or a narcissist or sometimes both, they make you question your own sanity mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And I really thought they're so good at gaslighting you. And I really thought, am I crazy? Am I the one that's creating this problem? Am I the one that's out of line here? And went on for months just really questioning myself. And really, it took a, a hit on my confidence, my self-esteem. And um, finally, I realized that, no, I'm not the problem in this situation. I actually went, um, and thank God for this, I went on vacation, Mm -hmm. and I was on a Caribbean cruise, so I didn't really have access to, like, media or anything, so I had just a lot of time to think Mm -hmm. and be in a beautiful environment. I said, you know what, this situation is under your control if you can get to a place in your head where you stop letting her get to you. Mm -hmm. And that's really when I was able to take control back of my work experience. And even though I was still dealing with this person and she was still a nightmare to deal with, it made it much more bearable and allowed me to kind of create an exit strategy so I could get out of the organization productively and move on with my career. Mm, That's great. And, you know, so one of the folks that I spoke to recently really was feeling like looking back at the situation and thinking, gosh, did I miss the red flags? Was there a sign that I should have seen? Did you feel like in your situation, did you feel like there were red flags that you missed? Or would there be things that you might suggest somebody else look for to try to avoid this kind of situation? Well, I absolutely think there are red flags that I was that I missed. And I was very hard on myself because as this was going on, I was actually completing my dissertation, which was all about young professionals being the target of workplace bullying. Oh, my gosh. So I'm almost <laughs> beating myself up. Actually, I'm like, why didn't you see this? Have you learned nothing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Um, so I was, I was pretty hard on myself for that. But, you know, narcissists are tricky and workplace bullies are tricky. And I'm using both terms because sometimes they're interchangeable and sometimes they're not. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's, it's, they do come across as just very charismatic and they're not all bad. Right. They're very they have that leadership gene. They can very be very creative. They can be passionate. They can be a little bit perfectionist. Um, but they're people that oftentimes a lot of people who don't have those natural leadership genes, they're the person you want to follow. Mm. And oftentimes that's why they raise, rise through the ranks in organizations. That's why they're successful. They know how to play that, that political game to really get people on their team. And so um, there are warning signs that you can look for in terms of how the person is framing their reality. Do they ever give credit mm. to other people? Do they admit faults? I think a really interesting question to ask someone like this is, you know, tell me about a time when you failed. I'm just curious about how you handled that. Mm-hmm. And what I can learn from that, um, and if they if they won't ever admit to failure or have a really hard time answering that question, that is a red warning light hmm. right there. That's a really so good narcissists- suggestion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what narcissists are really great at doing, they frame their reality, and they believe that reality one hundred percent. To them, it is not a lie; it is the absolute truth. Mm-hmm. And so you have to have um, yourself on a really firm stance to be able to stand up to that and say, no, I'm not the one that's crazy in this situation. I'm not the one distorting things, mm-hmm. even if just for yourself, if not for them. Mm-hmm. Well, Sue, if we feel like maybe we're working in a toxic environment, say we've kind of got this sneaking suspicion that we're working with a narcissist or that we have workplace bullies kind of in our midst, but we're not quite sure because like you said, we're questioning ourselves. We're sort of doubting ourselves. How can we know for sure that it truly is a toxic work environment? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that the the terms narcissist and bully, they get thrown around quite a bit. But what I want um, people to understand is that true narcissists are actually pretty rare. They only make up about 6% of the population. So it is actually a rare thing to have a true narcissist. Workplace bullying is a little bit um, more granular. But I guess, you know, it, the important thing is not, is this real? Is this is this um, something that I can know for sure and pinpoint and have the definition of? If you feel bad going into work every day, that is a toxic environment for you. Mm -hmm. If you feel like your motivation is just being drained, like it's a chore for you to get out of bed, like you're just stressed out and want to just scream in the car when you're driving home, that is a toxic environment. And, And the reason for it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you get yourself into a better place because you're going to be at work as a professional for decades Mm -hmm. and you don't want to go into it every day hating life. Sure. Well, do you think it's a fairly common experience that at some point in our career we, we hit this or is it, you know, is it rare? I feel like when I talk to folks who feel like they're in a toxic environment, I think they, they often think like, God, I'm the only one going through this issue. Like from your research are you seeing that it, it can be fairly common? Like, Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about estimates for narcissists, but estimates for workplace bullying vary so widely. Um, some people say it's about 40% of people who experience it, but there have been studies where up to 90% of people have either experienced workplace bullying or uh, witnessed it in some capacity. And the thing of it is, is that most people, when they're going through an experience like that, do not identify it as workplace bullying Mm. because it starts off very small. Workplace bullying especially is very, very tricky in that it starts off with those little things. And the analogy I use, it's it's like the frog in the pot of boiling water. Mm. If you you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water, it's just going to jump right out, right, because it's too hot. It knows that this is dangerous. But if you just put a, a frog in a pot of cool water and you just slowly bring it to a boil, the frog's just going to sit there until Mm -hmm. the pot comes to a boil. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's like when you're going through workplace bullying. Like little things will happen, like they move your chair or you don't get a message or someone says something in a meeting that you don't really understand the context of, um, but you might feel a little bit thrown under the bus, but you kind of dismiss it pretty quickly 
because it's just a small thing. I have other stuff to do. Mm -hmm. And then it just builds and builds and builds over time until it explodes. But I think a lot more people have been um, targets of this sort of behavior than we even know. Um, And only 40% of the people actually ever report it to the organization when it's happening. So it is, I think, a much more widespread problem than we give it credit for. I mean, and I'll reference the Me Too movement because I think that this is really important. The Me Too movement is great, and it's wonderful that all these women are now speaking out about their experiences. But sexual harassment is far from the only type of toxic behavior that people experience in the work environment. And there's still a lot of work to do in other areas. Sure. Well, so you mentioned that only a certain percentage of people actually report the behavior. I'm curious if we wake up and find ourselves in this environment where we know there's workplace bullying going on, we're unhappy. In your opinion, is it worth trying to change the situation to stay at the job? Or do you tend to advise people to start looking for something else at that point? I, what a great question, because it is it is ironic. I actually say the best piece of advice I have for most people who are going through this type of situation do not go to HR. Do not report it. Because what tends to happen in organizations is that no no organization and no HR department wants to admit that they have a problem with workplace bullying. Mm -hmm. And so they fight back against the people who are reporting it. And I actually saw this in my research. Um, You know, I interviewed a bunch of young professionals all under the age of 35 who experienced very severe workplace bullying problems Every single one of them reported it to HR. Almost every single one of them also reported it to other leaders in the organization outside of HR. The organization knew what was going on, but only one of them received any help and support. That's mm-hmm. go ahead. That's really interesting. You know, I have witnessed uh, at an organization where there was some sort of workplace bullying going on, and a number of people reported it right over time like over years and it almost seemed like every single person who reported it was actually relocated to another department or they were asked to leave the company something happened but the sort of source of the bullying remained in place like that particular person that was being reported just stayed in that position for a very long time so it was interesting because I think in their minds, they were reporting it to HR to get assistance. And in reality, they were sort of becoming the problem even more by raising their hand and, and identifying something. And that's exactly right. And that is not uncommon. Mm-hmm. It is, and, and there are organizations, I have to give credit where credit is due. There are organizations who have put firm procedures in place to be able to deal with workplace bullying when it is reported. University of Massachusetts at Amherst is one of those organizations where if someone reports workplace bullying there, there is not now a process that they have to go through to investigate, and there's all sorts of people involved. And so if you're in an organization like that, I say report it because there are safeguards in place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in most organizations, you're setting yourself up to be a target if you report it. That that makes sense. And I'm curious, like, from... What you have kind of seen in your research, you mentioned that narcissists are maybe 6% uh, of the population or or it's 6% of the time you might work for a narcissist. Do you find that the more senior level the person is that you're reporting to, like if it was a CEO, then they might be more likely to be a narcissist than if it was an entry level manager or does it make a difference? Um, I don't know of research either way on that. My gut feeling is that it probably doesn't make a difference. But what happens is that the more senior you get in the organization, the more power you have, the more influence you have. And so narcissists are smart. They're not going to let their behaviors that might detract from their career success like show themselves if it's going to hurt their career, Mm -hmm. right? But the more senior they get in the organization, the less people they have to report to, and their narcissist flag is free to fly (laughs) at that point. (laughs) And so I think you're much more likely to see the the behaviors from people in higher-level positions. But that doesn't mean that narcissists don't exist at lower levels. Again, it is a personality disorder. It develops very early on in life. So it's not as though people come into the workplace 
and become narcissists. This is something that's been going on since they were a kid, and then it just shows its head in the workplace. Mm-hmm. That totally makes sense. Well, so I'm curious if we've identified we work in a you know a toxic environment and we're looking for a new job, and maybe it's going to take us let's say three months to find that new job, and or let's say we found a new job and we've put in our notice and we have a few weeks left that we have to be at the company. How can we stay motivated to put our best foot forward every day when we go into this toxic place that we hate? Do you have any suggestions for us? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I actually I actually love this question. I'm going to answer it in, I think, a bit of a controversial way, okay. which is to say, why would you want to? Why do you have any incentive at this point to put all your energy into coming in and producing the best work you can if you're on your way out the door in an organization that has not supported you? And for my money, the organization has abandoned you at that point. They failed you. They had a responsibility to take care of the situation so that you didn't have to experience a talk toxic working environment, and they elected not to. So you don't owe them anything. I actually oftentimes recommend when people are leaving working environments like this, that they don't give notice unless there is a reason for it, unless they're getting a huge vacation payout or they're going to lose something by by not giving notice, I recommend they they resign and they leave that day Hmm. because it just makes things very, very clear. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen happen, especially in toxic organizations when people give notice, is somewhere in that two weeks or that month time frame, you get sabotaged. And then they fire you. for some. I've actually seen this happen to clients of mine where they gave notice they were going to transfer to another job in the organization. And in the period between when they gave notice, um, the their boss retaliated against them and came up with a reason to fire them. So they not only lost the job they're currently in, they lost the new job they were going to transfer to in the organization because they were being retaliated against. Wow. So it is actually safer for you. It may not feel great because we've been taught to give notice to people. But if an organization fires you, they're under no obligation to give you notice or severance. So you have to watch out and do what's best for you in those situations. Sure. Gosh, that's an interesting perspective. I hadn't really considered it that way. Um, You know, typically, I recommend that folks give, they do give notice because I think there are sometimes co-workers that you may work with that you may have a good relationship with and if you maintain that good relationship even if it's just with one or two people then you may have folks who can give you a reference in the future when you sort of still need somebody to speak up on your behalf even if it's not that narcissist that you work for but I do think you're right that uh, sometimes in that period it can become worse uh, during that last few weeks when they know that you're leaving um So I'm curious, one thing that often comes up too in this situation is on our way out, say we've given notice and and we're leaving, there's often an opportunity to do kind of what's called like an exit interview where we give the company feedback about our experience and maybe we have a meeting with HR and they say like, what did you think? Um, I've talked with a number of folks who are quitting and they often want to go into this interview, this exit interview, and give really candid feedback because they feel like maybe it's going to make a difference or they really want to sort of let off steam. Do you have any perspectives on whether or not giving feedback in an exit interview would be a good idea? I think it's great to get, well, you know, kind of to your last point, you always have to evaluate the situation that you're in and think about what's really important to you. If, if, if what you're doing is going to burn a bridge that's important to you, then you need to think twice about it. But I actually think that if the bridges that are worth keeping, they're not going to get burned down because you give honest feedback in an exit interview, mm. right? And I actually think it can be a very cathartic experience and give people a lot of closure that... Finally, they got to say what they wanted to say. And oftentimes what I see is organizations will listen in those exit interviews far more than they ever listened when the person was was still working for them, right? So Mm -hmm. it may be an opportunity for you to affect change. Um, And, like, again, with the burning bridges thing, the people that are really behind you that you have good relationships with, those relationships are going to endure Mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, it's the people that uh, you just didn't have great relationships with in the first place. Those people are going to fall away. But I'm always a fan of expressing what you want to express in the right outlets for it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Well, so I'm also curious when 
you mentioned your own experience and working for a narcissist, and it sounded like, you know, it's such a negative emotional experience. It kind of brings you down and makes you feel almost like a different person. Let's say you were a star performer for all of your career before this, and and now you're really kind of second guessing yourself. Do you feel like once we've quit this environment and we've gone on to a new job, like, is it possible to sort of rebuild our confidence and, and kind of get back to that person that we were before? I mean, you can, you can not only get back to the person you were before, you can go far beyond where you, where you ever were before. So absolutely, it's possible. It takes a lot of self-development work and a lot of self-reflection. And for me, it took about two years. Mm. of very intense self-development work. I went to a lot of retreats. I did a lot of meditation. I did a lot of work on myself to get back um, and go beyond where I ever was before in terms of my confidence and my sense of self and and things like that. Um, And what people need to know is that it just takes time. Mm. And it takes time to not only work through those emotions of what you experienced in that moment with that toxic boss or coworker or what have you, but you're not only working through that, you're working through past things in your life that led you to be in that situation in the first place. And this might be going back years and years, all to childhood and how your parents treated you and things like that. Um, So there's just a lot to work through because the reasons that these experiences trigger us so much is that they remind us of things that happened in the past. Sure, yeah. kind of programmed into our heads. So I always recommend that people, you know, go for it. Don't think that there is no hope. You can you can always change and create whatever experience you want and boost your confidence back and get that renewed sense of self. But just know that your commitment to change has got to be greater than your desire to stay in the place that you're currently in. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard ask for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, so I'm curious, as you as we move through that, and we're looking for something new, and we're looking for something healthier, you know, I think a common experience is to feel unsure in your in our ability to pick another good job, like we may feel like our picker is kind of broken when it comes to looking for another environment. Do you think that's a common experience to, to have that feeling? And do you think that if we've run into this toxic environment once that it means, you know, truly our, our picker is kind of off? Or, or what do you think about that? Um, I don't think it's that your picker is off, but understand that when you've gone through this experience, especially if you've been in it for an extended period of time of many months or even years, that's actually made physiological changes in your body to the point that you are now addicted to that type of environment. Mm. And I'll just expand on that a little bit because what happens when our brain and our body experience this emotional stress of being in that type of environment over and over and over and over and over again is, you know, anytime we experience stress, our brain releases these great chemicals into our body that makes us feel that stress. Mm-hmm. Right, so we we te- we tense up. We maybe get headaches. We we feel sick. Like there are physical symptoms of emotional stress. Now, what happens when you're doing this for an extended period of time is you're getting that fix every single day, and so you try to take yourself out of it and get yourself in a good, more stable type of position. And your body kind of works against you, and it says, "Come on, where are my stress hormones?" Mm -hmm. What's going on? And you actually start to go through withdrawal. And before you know it, you're, you're actually creating a situation, even if you're in a stable environment where you're creating these problems to create this type of stress again, so you can get those hormones. Now, this is all done on an unconscious level, Mm -hmm. right? You're not aware that you're doing this. So it might seem that your picker is off. But what is actually more likely that is happening is you're creating these problems because you want your fix. Mm. And just know that in most organizations, in most working situations, you can create a good experience out of it. You can create that ideal experience out of it, but it comes back to being very mindful again of how your actions are contributing to it. If you are the one unintentionally creating problems where there really didn't need to be, then that's, that's on you. Mm-hmm. That's not on, on the workplace that you picked. That's on you. And so that's where that self-development work becomes very important because you've got to take a very hard look in the mirror and say, what am I doing here? And what can I, how can I detach? 
and look at this from an unemotional place so that I can create a different experience for myself. Mm. That makes sense. Well, so I want to transition to one other topic that I want to ask you about, because I know this is something that you talk about, and I think you maybe write about this some, and that is in being intimidating to others. And sometimes, you know, coworkers will find us intimidating. And I'm curious, like, if we find ourselves in this situation where we do recognize that maybe other people uh, feel intimidated around us, what can we do about it and what causes it? Yeah, so the first thing that you have to understand is that if someone finds you intimidating, that doesn't have anything to do with you. That has to do with their perception of themselves. Because if a person was confident and secure and had just a beautiful perception of themselves, then no one's going to intimidate them. But most people are not in that place because of all the things we go through in life and and all of that. So in this case, I think it's really the difference between something being your fault and taking responsibility for something, Hmm. right? So, and I, and I, I, I think this distinction between fault and responsibility is important. What others do to us, how others perceive us is not necessarily our fault, but how we interact with them in the context of that is our responsibility. Mm. So if someone finds you intimidating, um, it may be because they don't feel like they're as smart as you, as talented as you. They feel like you're just more driven and passionate. They don't feel like they can do as good a job of you. So the question I would ask myself is, how can I make this person feel safe? How can I make this person feel powerful? How can I make this person feel like they can do all the things that I can do? Because frankly, they probably can. Mm -hmm. How can I lift that other person up? You know, we we tend to view work as a competitive environment where, you know, if you get that promotion, that means I can't get that promotion. If you get that project, that means I can't. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be a better experience if we're talking about how our actions create our ideal experience Wouldn't it be a better experience to say, what if we worked as a team to lift each other up? Mm -hmm. What if when someone kind of fell down or had a failure or had a misstep, instead of calling them out on it and and like pinging them on the performance review, we instead said, okay, how are we going to work through this together? What are we going to do about this? How are we going to learn from this? Mm -hmm. And that it's that feeling of psychological safety that really gets in the way a lot when it comes to work. So if you're if you're looking to not be as intimidating to other people, you have to take your own ego. And we all have an ego. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to take your own ego. You have to put it aside for a second and say, how can I serve this person and make their experience better? And when you do that, I guarantee you that reward is going to come back to you. Mm. I, I think you're right. It is a tough thing to do, though. <laughs> It's a it's a lot of responsibility. Well, Carlin, this has been excellent. Where can we go to learn more about you and more about your work at Zen Workplace? Absolutely. So you can check me out at zenworkplace.com. I also have a book coming out a little later this year that you can learn a little bit more about at zenyourwork.com. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you, Carlin, for joining me. This has been great. Oh, I, thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a fun discussion. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and thanks to those of you who sent me questions. You can send me your questions to Angela at copelandcoaching.com. You can also send me questions via Twitter. I'm at Copeland Coach, and on Facebook, I'm Copeland Coaching. Don't forget to help me out. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.